And um, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Rick. Please uh, give us a moment while we make the transition. And Rick, I am turning that over to you right now. Okay, so I clicked OK, so now everyone can see my desktop. Yes, right? it's loading right now. Hang on. Cool. Well, what I thought I'd do is uh, today, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining me. I'm sure some of you are at work, and if the boss comes by and sees that you're doing this, you know, just click out. Uh, it's okay if you have to go offline. But I thought I'd start with uh, uh, some pictures that I took uh, in Papua New Guinea. I just came back about two weeks ago, and I'm still taking the malaria medicine and some antibiotics. You know, it's great <laughs> being a travel photographer. It's great being a travel photographer. So I'll show you some pictures from my new book, Face to Face, which is actually my favorite book, in a couple of minutes. But I thought I'd start with this, 10 Key Ingredients for Cooking Digital Photographs. It's kind of a recipe. Get it? Ingredients, cooking, <laughs> recipe. Anyway, I whether you, you know, travel to a place like Papua New Guinea or just you know, shoot around town, I think these 10 ingredients really apply to all kinds of pictures. So I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. And then I could answer some questions. And as you can see, I have my keynote show open that I give uh, all around the world, as Catherine said. And uh, I'm going to be scrolling up and down and finding pictures. And maybe I'll be able to answer a question using a picture. So anyway, here's the first ingredient, an interesting subject, as simple as it sounds. Like this Huli Wigman, by the way, who was a security guard at the hotel that we're staying at, is posed by a waterfall. I, it's one of my favorite pictures from Papua New Guinea. Now, if I was, you know, squatting down, you know, watering my lawn, it would not make a great picture because I don't think that's an interesting subject. So as simple as it sounds, an interesting subject is one of the main ingredients. Another one is good composition. Again, very simple, but here's another shot that I like. I, pl I placed this man off center, so I left some dead space in the, in the scene. It's called some breathing room. Also, if you look at his eyes, I had him look up towards the sky, and that creates a beautiful catch light in the subject's eyes. And the catch light really makes the subject come alive. It makes their eyes sparkle. By the way, they're called Huli Wigmen because they're wearing these wigs made out of their hair, and they put these flowers in them to attract the, the spirits. I also only shoot raw files. All these files are raw files because... What I can do, or what you could do too, is you can rescue up to a stop of overexposed areas in your camera roar, or I saw some people asking about Lightroom and Aperture. Uh, you could rescue those, if those overexposed highlights. With a JPEG, they're gone and lost forever. I don't know if you could see me circling these feathers on the left-hand side, of, or actually the man's right or left, but these were a lot brighter than his wig over here. So I was able to rescue some of those highlights in, uh, in, well, you could rescue them in Aperture or Photoshop, whatever. Creative cropping is yet another ingredient. This is often overlooked. Here's a nice enough shot, but I just cropped in on the shot for perhaps a more creative picture. The first thing I do when I open a picture in uh, Photoshop is, or wherever is, I crop the picture because I want to add impact to the scene. Also, if I don't crop it, and if you don't crop it, when you're playing around with your histogram or your curves, the area that you're eventually going to crop out is going to affect your exposure decision. So that's why I recommend cropping first. Careful focus is another one. Just, hey, just because we have an autofocus camera doesn't mean our cameras know where to focus. When I'm photographing a person, I talk about this in face-to-face, -face, is I'm always focusing on the eyes. You also see some catch light in this subject's eyes, and that catch light is being added with, with a reflector. Seeing the light. This might be the most important thing I can share with you. Seeing the light. Our eyes have a dynamic range of about 11 f-stops. Digital SLRs can only see about five f-stops. So we have to learn how to see the light, see that contrast range, and then we have to learn how to control the light with the reflector, with the diffuser, or with the flash. But seeing the light and learning how to make fine-tune our, ex our exposure adjustments is so very, very important. Another thing is we have to check our camera settings. Hey, listen, I'm always checking my camera settings 
changing the white balance, changing the, the ISO. I always shoot at the lowest possible ISO to get the cleanest possible shot. So I'm always checking my camera settings to make sure that I'm not going to have a picture that's too noisy or too grainy or whatever. So talk about controlling the light. I use a flash. I never leave home without a flash for what's called daylight fill-in flash photography. This doesn't look like a flash picture, but it is because what I've done is I've balanced the light from the flash to the available light. And I talk about that in the book. But that's the key to using a flash. I don't want my flash pictures to look like flash pictures. Then we can control the light with the reflector. I talked about that before. Here I'm bouncing. Actually, I'm having an assistant bounce some light onto the subject's face. And we can control the light with the diffuser. On a sunny day, I use a diffuser. I place it between the subject between the subject and the sun to soften that light. And we can then fine tune our exposures with the plus minus control. I shoot all of my pictures, flash pictures on either aperture priority or shutter priority. And then I fine tune my exposures with the plus and minus control. Don't use manual. Then we have to learn how to play with the light. You know, when Kodak and Fuji came out with the super saturated films year, years ago, Everyone wanted super saturated pictures. Well, here I desaturated the picture. I added one of the frames uh, from On One Software. They have this great program called Photo Frame 3. It's a plugin, actually. Added the frame there. And I used the light rain action in Photoshop to take some of the reality out of the scene. When we take out some of the, rea the color from the scene, when we take out some of the sharpness from the scene, we take out some of the reality, and then our pictures become more creative. And the last key ingredient, I think, is having fun. I find the more fun I have taking pictures, the more fun the, subjects, the subject has. And listen, I have a lot of fun. You know, I do. People think being a travel photographer is a great thing. Well, it took two and a half days to get to Papua New Guinea. It took two and a half days to get back. And as I mentioned, I had to take the malaria medicine, the typhoid, and then I had to take the typhoid, yellow fever, and all this other stuff. But it's worth it. I wouldn't trade the job for, uh, for the world. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Or I could just talk about uh, my pictures. Um, someone was asking about the uh, play with light image and said that it looked overexposed. Oh, this picture? I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. yeah. What they're saying is that it may look overexposed. On my monitor, it looks fine. It is okay. a little light. So it if could it, be a monitor. Well, what, it could be monitor, you know, if the monitor is calibrated, you know, and if the room light has stayed the same, it should look pretty much the same. I have a, a Mac monitor. It, the picture definitely looks different on a, on, a, on a PC monitor. But the thing about photography is it's very subjective. Some people like a little darker pictures. Some people like pictures that look a little lighter. Compared to the other picture, it might look overexposed. Okay, so when you say play with light, how do you... I have a question about before other people start sending their questions in. How do you know that what you're seeing on your monitor is um, is accurate? How how do you do you have to um, compensate for? Well, if you have your monitor calibrated, if you go mm -hmm. through the, and your printer calibrated, if you want to make nice prints, if you have it calibrated, your pictures should look you know, the way that, that you want them to look. But I'm a travel photographer. I like to play with light. And here's an example. Here's a picture of the Croton on Hudson, of the Croton Dam, about five minutes from my home. It's actually the largest man-made stru stru stone structure in the United States. Look at this nice, beautiful, warm light. People like pictures like this taken at the golden hours, early in the morning, late in the afternoon, because they have deeper shades of red, orange, and yellow, right? So oh, that's about playing beautiful. with the light. Well, here's the actual original picture. It was taken after sunset. I got there too late, and the picture looks very flat. It looks very cold because this is the sun had set and it was cold light. But by boosting the reds and the yellows in Photoshop, and you could do this in Aperture and Lightroom, and by increasing the saturation and the contrast, I was able to turn the straight out of the camera picture into this picture. So that's what I, I mean when I talk about... Uh, uh, playing with the light. You see, you could call it, well, some people call it working with the light, but you know what? I have so much fun, I call it uh, playing with the light. That's great. 
Um, someone was asking, how do you how do you balance the flash to give it a non-flash uh, appearance? How do you balance the light from the flash? Here's, a, here's an example. This is a flash picture. I took this in Venice earlier this year at Carnivale. It doesn't look like a flash picture because we don't have those harsh shadows. However, if you look in the eyes, you see a little reflection from the flash, and that's the catch light. Here's how I balance the light from the flash to the available light so the pictures don't look like a flash picture. And here's another example. These both are flash pictures, just one flash, and I'm firing the flash with, a, with the Canon remote transmitter, the wireless transmitter, and I have a diffuser over the flash which softens the light. So here's how I balance the light from the flash to the available light. I might find a, another picture in here. Uh, no, let me go down here. Well, first what I do is I set my camera on manual exposure. This is the only time I'm using manual. Here's a pretty good example. This person was in the shade, again, at Carnivale, and St. Mark's Tower is in the background. What I do is I set my camera on manual, and I dial in the exposure for the available light, the background, here, St. Mark's Square in the sky. I take a shot, and I test my exposure. And I check my exposure. I check the histogram on the back of my camera. I check the overexposure warning. Once that's set up, then I turn on my flash, turn on my flash, and I start by reducing the flash output by minus one and one-third because I don't want to blast the subject with light. I take the shot. If, it's too, if the subject's too dark, it means I've reduced it too much. That's the view, and if it's too light, it means I haven't reduced it enough. So I have a Canon 580EX flash, and that lets me control the flash output. But a lot of digital cameras today come with built-in flash exposure compensation that actually lets you do this in camera, lets you do this in camera also. It takes a little while to get this down, but once you get it down, once you get it down, it really is not that hard. It becomes, it's like playing the guitar. Uh, you know, like Eric Clapton when he's playing guitar, he's not thinking about what note he played, what note he uh, is going to play, what note he's playing, <laughs> what note he's going to play. It just, he just does it. Here's a pretty good example of daylight fill-in flash also. What I did, just to go over it again, I dialed in the exposure for the background, got a nice exposure of the sky. This is over in Papua New Guinea, by the way. Then I turned on my flash, reduced the flash output, and with the, with the flash, uh, with the diffuser mounted on the flash, and I got a nice, evenly balanced shot. Oh, I see. Here, here's, an, here's another example of that. And you can do this indoors, too. I don't know if you, I think I went through it too quickly, but here's a nice sunset shot where the flash is balanced to the available light. And indoors, you can do this, too. Here's a picture of my son, Marco, or two pictures. The flash picture on the right is a harsh flash shot. You see that shadow. Picture on the left is also a flash shot. But by putting the camera on manual, boosting up the ISO, dialing the dialing in the exposure, um, uh, uh, dialing the right exposure for the manual setting, turning on my flash, I was able to get a beautiful natural looking picture, as I did here. This is a daylight fill and flash picture on the top right, and on the bottom it shows you what happens if you don't use daylight fill and flash. And here's another example of using daylight fill and flash. So I never leave home without uh, a flash and a reflector and a diffuser. So wow. is the flash um, okay? Yeah, yeah, the flash is, oh, I see someone asked a question. Yeah, one of my flash photography tips is take the, I'll, I'll tone it down, take the darn flash off your camera because what you can do, you can then hold it. And I, my favorite lens is a, for people photography is a 24 to 105. So with that lens on my 1DS Mark III, I can definitely hold the camera, the flash in my left hand. Oh. Yes, someone asked about multiple flashes. Yes, with the IR transmitter, you could fire up to 50 or more flashes. Uh, Michael is asking, do you use the DOF preview button on your camera at all? And if so, how do you use it? Do you count for the life of himself, understand it? He tried it in AV, but it only lightens or darkens. Right. Well, uh, I don't know what the, what is it, DOF? I have no idea what that means. Only kidding. 
What the DOS of means is that's a depth of field, depth of field preview button. Ah. And by pressing that, you can check the depth of field. The reason the picture gets darker is because you're always looking at the picture before you, uh, you're always looking at the scene before you take a picture with the lens opened wide. So when you press the depth of field, like I took this picture at F11, took this in Mongolia, I used the depth of field preview button to stop down so I could make sure that this uh, camel hair over here was in focus and, the, and the, uh, his uh, belts over here were in focus. So I do check my uh, depth of field in, usually in landscape photography and in portrait photography. Like in this picture here, I took this in, I took this picture in the Royal Kingdom of Bhutan. And you can see the prayer flags in the foreground are sharp, and or the sharp on my monitor, and the background elements are sharp. Taken at f16, I checked the depth of field to make sure that I could uh, see the uh, see the flags. But the other thing I do is after I take the shot, I use the magnifying feature on my camera and I zoom in, and I zoom in to uh, to uh, check it. Well, I use the Canon 1DS Mark III and the 1D Mark III. But here, are, just getting back to flash, here are two of the diffusers that I use. Uh, the one on the left is from LumaQuest, the one on the, on the right is from Adorama. And I also use uh, a lot of uh, diffusers and reflectors from uh, FJ Westcott. I don't know if I have a picture of the actual product here, but I don't. Um, but, but softening the light is, like here, here's a daylight fill and flash picture that doesn't look at all like a daylight fill and flash picture because you can't see the shadows. So I'm adding just a hint of light, a hint of light there. Oh, oh how do you fire the handheld flash? Well, with a wireless transmitter. It could, if that's the, um, the whole, uh, that's the cool thing about it. You put the wireless transmitter in the hot shoe and then it fires the flash. And you can put the flashes on stands um, so you could do indoor uh, indoor portraiture. Wow. Yeah, you're definitely a pro. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, well, well. Guess what? Here, here's a shot. People see this and say, "Oh, Rick, man, you're a pro. You got this shot." Or they see uh, this shot and they say, "Rick, you're a pretty good cowboy photographer." Or, Look at this shot. You're pretty good. You know, not bad. You know, you go out west to get all these shots of the horses and the cowboys. You know. Well, here's the thing. All these pictures were taken on one of my workshops or on several workshops. And the cooperation we have from the cowboys, you know, they have radios like in this, in this picture, the person on the left is the lead cowboy. And we sent them out a few times to rustle up the dust. And we had the horses, you know, separated like that. And everyone on the workshop got these same kind of, got the same pictures because we had so much cooperation. So um, I always suggest that people don't um, compare your pictures to uh, pictures you see in the magazine unless you know what went on behind the scenes. I don't use a tripod. Someone asked that. I don't uh, really like to pack those around. Yeah. Yeah, when shooting in the TV mode, I, I have major problems with getting enough light in the photo, even with a high ISO setting. Uh, that shouldn't be. Well, fill flash would be the answer, but in the TV mode, if you set the eye, the expose, you know, in, if you're outdoors, even on like a cloudy day, ISO 400 should be enough to give you a good exposure. I do have someone ask about HDR photos, high dynamic range photos, and for those of you who don't know what high dynamic range is, what you do is you put your camera on a tripod. Uh, here's my high dynamic range thing in Photoshop. What you do is you take exposures from uh, the shadow areas up to the, uh, the uh, actually the highlight areas out here. And it had snowed when I just read about this, and I'm photographing my kitchen looking out of the pond. So the snow's the right exposure here. And here, the snow is in the windows outside is totally blown out, but we can see the shadows. So you go to File, Automate, Merge to High Dynamic Range. You ready for this? That's amazing yeah. that you can that you can get this type of shot. I will, just to give you another example of high dynamic range, I was up at this ice hotel. Here's what it looks like from outside. This is a cool place. You don't need high dynamic range for that type of picture. But if you look at this picture, this was a series of several pictures. 
you could see detail in the flame on the right. We could see detail in the sky. We could see detail in the snow. And we could see inside the ice hotel. High dynamic range is amazing. And I've just used the one in Photoshop. There are other uh, programs out there. A photo mechanics makes a, a good one. But this is the one that I, I use. And if anyone wants to know, yeah, someone just said like Photomatics. If someone wants to know about, uh, learn about high dynamic range, my friend Ben Wilmore, you could do a search on him. Uh, uh, he, he's like the, the expert on high dynamic range. But it, it, is, it, is, it is totally cool. Yeah, I have a question. Are those ice hotels cold? <laughs> well, here's a, the ins an inside view of the ice hotel. The uh -huh. real picture that I should have gotten is you can sleep in this. You could sleep on a bed of ice. And honeymoon couples uh -huh. think, hey, this will be a lot of fun to sleep in the ice hotel, you know, on our honeymoon. Well, the real picture would have been the honeymoon couples coming out of here in the morning <laughs> to see their faces like, what were we thinking? I stayed in a nice lodge. I stayed in a nice lodge uh, okay. right, near, right, near, right nearby. I didn't want to distract you, but I've always wondered about that. Yeah. How do you so, focus at alert. shots at night? Uh, well, digital cameras and uh, all, all focus cameras use contrast to focus. If there's not enough contrast, if it's going to zoom in and out, I will switch to manual focus. I'm looking for a picture where I might have used manual focus. Uh, or if there's distracting elements in the foreground, I might switch to manual focus. Um, then someone else is about bracketing. Because I shoot raw f raw files, someone like the bedroom shot. Because I use I shoot raw files, which have a much wider exposure latitude than JPEG files. I don't bracket. And actually, some of my friends, I had this, this discussion with my friend Daryl Galeen, a wonderful wildlife photographer. He doesn't bracket either. But the thing is, you have to learn how to see the light. If you learn how to see the light and can get a good exposure right out of the camera, then you don't have to bracket. Let me, uh, let me look for an example here. Oh, well, here. Here's a picture of a, a polar bear. I know from past experience that when you're photographing a white subject, you have to increase the flash exposure by plus one because all that white fools the camera's meter into thinking that the scene is darker than it is. It's brighter than it is, and it underexposes your picture. So learning how to see the light in that case is important. In a case like this, I knew this subject was toplit and backlit. This was taken not too far from my house. I knew a flash was needed to fill in the shadows here. In a situation like this, I was over in Africa, actually teaching a private workshop, which was a lot of fun. I knew that to get this picture, I had to underexpose the scene by about a stop. So the sun over here wasn't overexposed and washed out. Um, now you might think, uh, oh, well, I read in all the photography magazines, don't underexpose the picture because uh, you get too much, you're gonna get more noise in the shadow areas. Well, I'm not really underexposing the scene. What I'm doing is I'm exposing the scene for the highlights, and that's what I always do. I shoot slide film like I shoot, I shoot digital like I used to shoot slide film. I'm always exposing for the highlights because I don't want the highlights to be overexposed and washed out. Here, here's an example. Here's an example of like a raw file on the left and a JPEG file on the right. If you don't expose for the highlights, the light feathers on this Karakara's neck, and you just leave your camera in automatic and shoot a JPEG, you might lose this detail, as you can see over here on the right. If you shoot raw files, it's a little overexposed, you can rescue that uh, in, in the digital darkroom. How do you manage to keep your batteries warm? Uh, I keep my batteries warm in my coat. And someone points out that the 1D3, 1DS Mark III and the 1D Mark III, they do have unbelievable batteries. It seems like they never, like they never wear out. What meter well, mode do you usually yes. use? Right. Well, getting back to um, getting back to seeing the light, I could use a, in, the, in this picture, which believe it or not, I took in the Gobi Desert of this little of this 15-year-old girl. She was selling souvenirs, by the way, on the side of the road. Her brother comes up on a motorcycle, 
and I made the shot because one of my big things is I tell people for what I do, there's a big difference between taking a picture and making a picture. I like to make pictures. So anyway, I made this, but I could have used a spot meter uh, here, but I knew that well, I wanted to get a good exposure of her face. So the background was a little brighter than her face, so I had to increase the exposure just a little with the plus and minus keys on my, on my camera. If I could go to another shot here, again, I could have used you know a spot metering, but I just use the average metering system. I always leave my camera on that, and then use the plus and minus keys on my camera to increase or decrease the exposure. Here, I wanted more saturated colors. I didn't want the highlights up here blown out. So I, under, I set the exposure at minus, probably for this one, about minus, minus one. Oh, the one above that, how do you know which metering modes to use? Well, I always use the same one because it, it really comes down to seeing the light. It really comes down to seeing the light. And if you use the average one and you know what's bright, what's dark, and you know the exposure you want, you could get to the same place a lot quicker if you learn, if you learn how to see the light. And then you have to just know what uh, exposure compensations to make. I'm looking for another example where uh, a plus and minus setting might have worked. So he also asks, is, is there an advantage from center weighted or partial metering? Well, if you're starting out, like if you wanted a picture like like this, these are two uh, get two penguins that I photographed in, in Antarctica. The background here is brighter than the scene. Put your camera on automatic metering, the birds are going to be underexposed. But because I knew that the background, you know, would have fooled. You could have used a spot meter in this situation. But what I'm doing is I'm just opening up a little so we, I could see the birds. I'm always exposing for the subject, no matter, no matter you know, what, what the subject is. A lot of people in the past like to use spot metering. But again, I just dial in, dial in the exposure uh, using the plus and minus keys. So it sounds like a lot of it just comes from experience. Well, that's right, Catherine. It's like playing the guitar, getting back to Eric Clapton. He's not thinking about, oh, I have to turn this dial, press this pedal, bend this note, you know, play this note, that note, that note. He's just doing it. And at the, actually, at the end of my seminars, that's, that's the slide I leave people with. I'm not leaving yet, but uh, this is it. Okay. Uh, and, it's, I, you know, people are going to hear a lot of stuff today. I hear, I forget. This is a, um, an expression by Confucius, by the way. I see, I remember. People are going to look at the pictures, they're going to remember it. But the real magic, the real fun, the real joy happens the real ha when, you, when you do this. And when you understand it, that just, that's the magic. That's, that's really the magic. But someone says, isn't seeing the light a matter of knowing your camera, which means taking a lot of practice? Yes. Um, you have to know what your camera can do and what your camera can't do. Like, I think I said that our eyes have a dynamic range of about... 11 f-stops, but digital cameras can only see about 5 f-stops. So what we have to do is we have to set our exposure for the highlights, usually, um, so they're not overexposed and washed out. And then we could play, we could fine-tune our exposures in the, in the digital darkroom. Someone's asking, do you have a shot that looking back was a dangerous one to go after? And I bet you have some good stories there. Uh, do I have a good story about something dangerous? Yeah, or maybe that something that was probably too dangerous looking back. Oh, oh looking back on my photos? Yeah, yeah I have something. Well, yeah, I have something that uh, is right here. I was in uh, Papua New Guinea, and uh, yeah, I, sh I showed those pictures in the beginning, right? And uh, I, I was photographing the, uh, the cultures there, and I wanted to go to the skull caves. So I asked the chief, I say, hey, can you take me to the Skull Caves? Well, to get people to like me and accept me, I bring a lot of magic tricks with me. I buy them in New York City at a store called Tannen's Magic. And I did this trick. He said, well, listen, I'll take you to the Skull Cave if you show me how to do the trick. I said, I can't show you how to do the trick because that would break the magician's code. He says, Come. well, I really want to know the trick. Well, I really wanted to see the Skull Cave, so I showed him the trick. Then he says, then we go inside. We go inside, and he says, listen, if you show me the other trick you did, here's inside the skull caves, I'll take you to the cannibalism ceremony. 
They have cannibalism there. <laughs> they do. And I said, can't do it. He says, please show me the trick. I said, okay, I'll show you the trick, but I want to skip lunch. Get it? <laughs> cannibalism. Right. So we come, out of the skull, <laughs> we come out of the skull cave. We're driving down the road, right? And these guys stop our vehicle. Guy on the left is pointing his bow and arrow right at me. You could see his uh, left shoulder muscle, right, is flexed here. He's not kidding around. This guy in the middle, this guy in the middle has his finger on the trigger of this homemade shotgun, which could just go off at any minute, right? So I'm, my son was three years old at this time. I'm really scared. But I figure, hey, I, I got to take the picture because if someone finds my camera, gives it to my son, uh, he'll say, um, you know, hey, my dad was a photographer until the end. Uh, so I took the picture. I'm glad I did because one second later, this is what was happening. These guys were just kidding around with me. <laughs> so, I, so I was a little scared. Then I got out of the car. And one thing I like to tell people is get involved with the subject. Really get involved with it because it makes it more fun for them. So I was letting them play with my cameras, and then I'd play with the bow and arrow. So in this case, I, didn't, I, I got involved. I was having a great time. And then we went over to their village, and here it smelled a lot like Woodstock in 1969. It actually did, but I didn't get involved in this case because I was working, and uh, you know I'm in this foreign country. But getting involved is usually a good idea. It really makes the photo sessions a lot more fun, uh, a lot more fun for the for the people. And 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 if you do that, you'll get better shots. Want to hear one more story? Sure, sure. Another time I was scared, I was photographing these lions mating. And um, someone asked me how I got started, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, I was photographing these lions mating, and the guide says, whatever you do, don't move in the vehicle. Don't move. Well, I uh, really wanted to get the shot, so I stood up. The lions stopped mating. They started walking to the open vehicle. I'm really scared now. They were about maybe uh, 50 yards away. They come closer, 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 and closer. And then they, I, they're like three feet, maybe not three feet, about six feet away from me, thought they're going to pounce up and attack me, and this is what happened. They were so tired from mating, they just lied down in the shade of the vehicle. Here's, here's me, <laughs> oh, my, my shadow here, and here's, uh, here's my friend's shadow. But as you can see, we're in an open vehicle, so look at these muscles. I mean, my God, these lions could have attacked us. I, and here's the female, by the way. She didn't, she didn't want to mate. Here's the male he wanted to mate. Uh, so it's uh, those are two those are two uh, scariest times uh, I've had. Uh, I, I was in Antarctica, in Antarctica, and um, it, you could get pretty seasick there because uh, the seas could be sixty to ninety feet. So someone says, "How did I get started photography?" If you don't mind me asking. Actually, I went to Berkeley College of Music, and I majored in music, and majored in arranging and composition. And I had a lot of downtime. And I love photography. My father got me into it. So I was reading a magazine. I sent a picture to a magazine, and they published it. Then they asked me to write an article about another picture. I did that. Then with zero training, they asked, this is 1978. The magazine was Studio Photography and Design. Then they asked me to be the editor. I was the editor for three years. Then a um, uh, major advertising agency in New York City calls me up and they want me to head up the camera account. So for 10 years, I was like in New York City, believe it or not, with a suit and tie on, you know, heading up a major camera account. But it's there that I learned the value of promoting oneself. And I spend a lot of time promoting myself, like all photographers should do, because it's a business. Sure, it's a lot of fun, you know, getting, you know, going to all these exotic places, like I was in Namibia, and I got this shot of this person standing on the sand dunes in Africa, taking this shot of a sunrise. I was in Machu Picchu, getting shots like this. You know, it's a lot of fun, but it's a business. And I make a lot of decisions based on business. And one, one good thing about having books, if I could just open this, uh, this little window for a while, my new book, Face to Face. And if anybody wants more information on photographing people, if you just, you could go get to this from uh, the homepage of my website. Uh, magically, my friends at, uh, my friends at uh, O'Reilly got uh, this 
uh, introduction up here with some of the pictures. So you could get a little preview of what's in the book before and after pictures and, and whatever. Uh, so uh, having a book is the greatest calling card because it opens a lot of doors for you. It really, it, it really is a great, great thing. Someone says, uh, what are you using for your presentation? Yes, it's Keynote. It's, uh, it's Keynote, and I'm on, a, I'm on a Mac. I used to use yeah. uh, PowerPoint, but the, the Keynote presentations are really, uh, uh, you know, if I went through this, I'm just showing you this, showing it to you this way because I want to scroll around, but, you know, I have it dissolved between each, uh, between each slide. I don't want to interrupt you, but there were a couple of questions uh, people were asking about the uh, white balance, and I think that uh, there were a few people anxious to know about um, mm -hmm. white, white balance. balance. Sure. Do you shoot well, auto white balance shoot, and then? No. Even if you shoot raw files, you should use, even if you, you, sh you should set the white balance, because you want to do as little as possible in the digital darkroom. So I don't use, the only time I use automatic white balance is if I'm taking a natural light shot in my kitchen with daylights coming through and there's fluorescent lights. And then I could play with it in Photoshop. I'm not an advertising photographer. I don't have to get exact colors. Like if I was photographing, I don't know what kind of shirt this cowboy's wearing, but say it's a Land's End shirt. If the art director was there, he or she would want that red to be that exact red. So in that case, you know, I'd set the camera up for manual white balance and, 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 and use manual white balance. But I set my white balance for the existing lighting additions, and then on, me, on many occasions, I like to warm up my pictures by boosting the reds and the yellows. But sometimes you don't want to do that. Here's an example. If you look at these two pictures, some people listening may like the picture on the right because it has more vibrant colors. It's more saturated. And as I mentioned before, when Kodak and Fuji introduced their films, this is the kind of pictures you'd get. It looks like this picture was taken in the late afternoon. But the picture on the left is a more natural-looking picture. Those are more natural colors. So I think about white balance, but I'm, I'm really thinking about the end result, what kind of mood do I want to create with my pictures? So in this picture, for example, you know, I may I may have may have boosted the yellows a little to create to create this effect. Uh, in my nighttime pictures, I might uh, boost the blues. I just saw a nighttime picture in here somewhere. Uh, I might here. I might boost the blues to give the pictures a little a little cooler tone. I'm always thinking about the end result. And uh, here's another example. You might think this is a boring shot color-wise, and guess what? It is. There's very little color in the <laughs> sky, right? But just by going to Photoshop and pulling down, you know, the curves, or by boosting the level of the shadow slider here, we could turn this shot into this kind of shot. And you could do the same thing in Aperture. Someone asked me before, uh, Scott's asking you right now, but if you're using Windows, I use Aperture in the field to, you know, download my pictures. It's super fast. I use it to organize my pictures. And at home, I use it to enhance my pictures. If you go on the articles page of my website, there's uh, my favorite list of ap Aperture features there, uh, illustrated with a picture I took. Uh, actually, some of my pictures. I think, uh, I think they're the Venice pictures. So yeah, someone's talking about the On One plugins. Yeah, they are great. Someone was asking, generally, how many shots per scene do you take? Do you well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. If I could get back to that, those Botswana pictures. When I was teaching the Botswana workshop the first day, I asked the guy, I said, what's your goal? And uh, he said, I want to take 700 pictures a day. I said, what? He said, yeah, I want to take 700 pictures a day. I said to him, well, listen, we were going to be there for uh, uh, like 10 days. I said, listen, if I could come away, if I could come away with a dozen great pictures, I'll be happy. So I don't use the shotgun approach. I really try to carefully, you know, select my subjects. One reason is my camera, 1DS Mark III, gives you a 26 megabyte file, and the files are huge. Wow. And it does slow you down. And if you, if, you, if you think about, if you think about the pictures that you want to take, 
you'll, I think you'll actually get good pictures. But here you see, you now I had my camera on rapid frame advance. And, uh, and that's why I was able, this is one shot uh, out of a series. Oh, someone else asked about a scary situation. Well, here I was teaching a workshop in, uh, in Montana. And I was so focused on helping the students that I wasn't paying attention to what was going on around me. And this is what happened. The bear's cub started crawling up my leg. These are real bear claws. This is bear slobber. And actually took a little bite out of me here. And then, so the good news is this was, the picture was taken, you know, after my son was born. And as my uh, buddy Steve Weiss knows, who actually signed me up for my face to Facebook with, uh, with O'Reilly knows, my voice was a oh, lot yeah, deeper. Steve. Yeah, this, oh my this gosh. Is like a, my voice was a lot deeper before that picture was uh, before that picture was taken. And I see you got the photograph. But yeah, my friend uh, at, at, at Canon took that. Uh, getting back to the flash, here's a nice enough flash picture. We could see the man took this in Papua New Guinea. You know, he's sharp and everything. But one thing I like to do is what's called dragging the shutter. If you look at this picture, this looks a little more creative. Uh, I see guest number three had, had a good comment. I wonder who that could be. Anyway, uh, <laughs> here is what's called, what, what's, what's here is called dragging the shutter. And uh, what you do is you select a slow shutter speed, like an eighth of a second, put your flash on, and you actually just move the camera a little from left to right to get this type of uh, shot. And you can, it's not hard to turn snapshots into great shots. Here's another example. I was in, um, uh, down in the Panama, and I wanted to get a shot of this woman here. Uh, I picked the background. My friend's holding a, uh, a reflector. Actually, it was my guide. She's holding a reflector, bouncing light onto the subject's face, and I got this nice portrait. So what I like to do when I talk about that in Face to Face is I like to you know, make pictures and I like to turn snapshots into, you know, I'm sure every picture I take isn't a great shot, but I, I like to take it into, in, I like to turn it into a much nicer picture. That's great. Wow. Well, here's, an, here's another example. Picture on the right is a snapshot. I was over in a Maasai village. You know, it's a nice enough shot, but if you look at the picture on the left, I took the time to position this woman in front of the doorway to her hut, so we have a beautiful silhouette. Make pictures, don't take pictures. This is what I recommend to uh, to uh, to people. Like someone's asking, yeah. how do you keep the eyes sharp on the drag shutter? Ah, uh, well, I might have sharpened those a little in Photoshop, but that's that's uh. the key. The, to get the eyes sharp. So you take the picture with the flash and then you move. And the flash actually, f what's in the center of the frame tends not to be as blurred as what's around the frame. Ah, okay. And then someone's asking how about sharpening? I think that's... Right. I always, that's a good point too. Um, what I like to do is I like to, well, first of all, you want to sharpen last because when you adjust levels, you're adjusting the sharpness and the, and the contrast and the color all together. You always want to sharpen last. Um, I'm looking for an example that uh, will illustrate my point. Plus, you want to sharpen selectively, meaning you want to sharpen a select part of the image and you don't want to sharpen, you don't want to sharpen globally. Uh, here's a picture of a woman I took in, uh, in Brazil. If we just sharpen this whole thing globally, the background, which is a little, which is out of focus intentionally, so the subject stands out. Um, if we sharpen the whole thing globally, um, and just I'll interrupt myself. This illustrates my best, uh, or my, I don't know, if it's my best one of my uh, uh, favorite photo philosophies, and it's this: that the camera looks both ways. In picturing the subject, we're also picturing a part of ourselves. So when you look at this picture of a woman you knew exactly how I was feeling. When I photographed this Buddhist monk who exuded, you know, a love, you could see that I have a great sense of respect for him. So the camera looks both ways in picturing the subject. You know, also picturing a, a part of ourselves is, is really important. But anyway, getting back to sharpening, 
if you globally sharpen, uh, what happens is like out of focus areas tend to show the noise. In in this picture, I used to go out with uh, Al McPherson, and if you sharpened the picture globally instead of just the subjects, the noise would have showed up here. This isn't actually on McPherson. It's actually taken at the Wax Museum in New York City. <laughs> this is to demonstrate. This is to demonstrate. I'm sure guest number three likes this one. Uh, this is this demonstrates what happens uh, when you don't use that plus one setting that I talked about for the polar bear when there's white in the scene. The picture becomes underexposed. So when you have white in the scene, you really want to use a plus one setting. And here, here's another example of it. Picture on the left, no uh, increase of the flash exposure. Here on the right, we have the right flash exposure. So I like to sharpen, I like to sharpen selectively. And you could do that in Photoshop with the convert to smart filters. And uh, <laughs> I'm laughing at one of the comments. Uh, uh, you can convert to smart filters, or you could do that with layers. But you really want to think selectively. You don't want to think globally. So um, uh, it was a fisheye yeah. shot. Someone, it's a true fisheye shot yeah. with my full frame uh, fisheye camera. What's the difference between sharpening an unsharp mask? Who the heck knows? No, seriously. Uh, <laughs> unsharp mask is a popular technique. Smart sharpen is more popular because it lets you sharpen the uh, highlights and the shadows independently. How do you catalog all your photos and keep everything, uh, especially after you crop? Well, because I shoot raw files, my uh, I never destroy my raw files. I, I can't touch my raw files; they're always going to be the same. But because I do books and magazine articles, you know, I'm I'm always cropping and fly presentations. I'm always cropping first. So here. I cropped out the dead space here. It was boring on the top, boring on the bottom. Here, same thing. Uh, no, not <laughs> here the same thing. In this picture, I cropped it like a panorama. Here, I cropped this picture to the square format. And then in the next picture, I cropped this to the uh, high definition format. I'm always cropping first. I have friends at Photoshop World who I talk to like in the speaker's lounge and uh, they say, oh, you got you got a crop in camera, but sometimes it's impossible, it's impossible to do that. So that's when you want to crop afterward to add more impact to the scene. Once you process which format, I save in TIFFs because my book publishers like TIFF files. And that also, you could save your files as uh, with the layers. Well, Jeffrey, I really enjoyed this. Thanks. Well, I'm glad. I'm sorry you got to go. His boss probably saw him, you know, <laughs> checking this out at work. <laughs> oh, one other thing that's, uh, that uh, is uh, important in photographing people is body language. If you look at this picture, this man looks kind of closed, right, because his arms are folded, right? But I asked him to drop his arms. He looks more relaxed here. So body language is very, very important. Uh, and here's another example of body language. I was over in Hong Kong in 1975 photographing uh, this man, and he was charging $1 a photo. I went to take the extra photo, and he's charging me. He's saying $1, $1. So body language is, uh, is important. And then um, someone's asking how you feel about Adobe DNG, talking about formats. DNG, the digital yeah. negative. Um, a lot of I, I like the digital negative. What for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, you can save your files as digital negatives. So, on the off chance that you know, 25 years from now, there's a version of Photoshop that doesn't open your raw files with the camera that you buy today. If you saved your raw files as digital negative, you, you could always open them in Photoshop or Elements. So it's a format. It's like a TIFF file. It's like a JPEG file. Okay. And then... Oh, someone asked about banding. Okay, the banding. Scott knows what he's talking about. A banding is you actually see the bands of the pixels, and it, it could, you know, I don't see that. But that's I another don't see reason it either. So. Raw, but that's another reason to shoot raw files, because in the shadow areas with JPEGs, if they're very underexposed, 
you you might see you probably will see the banding. I'm looking for an example where I have a, a dark background. You might you might see the banding. Uh, where the heck is that? Well, anyway, um, with the raw files, you won't see the you won't see the banding. Okay. Uh, Michael, is there an average? Wait, wait, it just jumped. Is there an advantage of TIFFs over? No. I know you do because you book people. I go, the files seem large. Is there? No. Well, the TIFF files include the it. layers also. Okay. Uh, yep. Thank you. Obviously, I love your advice. Well, you know what? Um, every, uh, you say you're a novice. Every, uh, every uh, amateur was a novice, you know, at one time. Oh, someone talks about flattening. Yeah, I flat before I uh, send off my files. I flatten. Uh, I flatten them. Here's something fun that uh, that the people listening may want to try. Look at this boring picture on the left, and look at the creative picture on the right. I did the picture on the right with a uh, picture on the left. I took with my whatever is $500 flash unit. Picture on the on the left. The picture on the right. I, I did. I made this picture with a two dollar and ninety nine cent flashlight. I'm in a totally dark room. Subject's on a stool. My camera's on a tripod. The ISO is set to ISO eight hundred. And I have this flashlight. I release the shutter. I make an exposure of ten seconds, and I just walked around the subject and I painted her with light. I just shine the light all over. You know, that's why you can see the hair light. It looks like I have several different lights on this. This is called painting with light. It's a lot of fun to do, but you have to be in a dark room. Here's another example of painting with light. Here's a natural light exposure down the bottom, and here's my little tiny flashlight, and I just painted the subject with light. You don't get this right away because you're going to move the light at different times. Um, someone says fishy. Uh, some, uh, you're going to move the light at different times. But you have to be in a dark room. You can get some really nice pictures. You can get some really nice pictures with painting with light. Beautiful. How do you back up your files? Well, I'm a nut on backing up. I have uh, two hard drives in my... Uh, Studio here. I have two hard drives next to the house, in the house, in case something happens. So I'm a nut about. I have everything backed up, you know, in four places. Oh, good. Good. Oh, someone says go time machine. Scott says time machine is good too. It auto autom automatically can back up to uh, a hard drive. How do you get? How do you get folks to want to have their pictures taken? Uh, never, never hurts to ask. I'm usually working with a guide, so when I'm in like a uh, village here, the guide goes in first. You know, says, "Is it okay to go in?" We were over in Namibia, and uh, we had a guide uh, go in first and set everything up. But I've really never been. Only once I think I've been turned down. Here in the Gobi Desert, I. I, I I say, you know, I'll send you the picture. I pay people for pictures. You know, sometimes it's five dollars, sometimes it's twenty dollars. I've never really had a, had a problem. It's, uh, but I think the people know, people know that I respect them, and that's really important. You have to have respect for the subjects because people can feel that, and I think they know that I'm photographically in love with them, and I think that's really part of. Uh, uh, really part of being a, a photographer, uh, getting it, falling in love with the subject. Someone says, are you getting releases? I don't get releases because I'm in Namibia. I'm photographing this person. You know, the person, you know, this person doesn't speak English, right? The release is going to mean nothing to them. I paid them. And I use the pictures for editorial work. Like, I've, I had some pictures uh, that people wanted to use for ads. And because I don't have releases, you know, I've lost probably tens of thousands of dollars. But, you know, imagine if you're in uh, in, in an, an exotic location and, and you're photographing and you pull out a piece of paper and you're asking someone to, to sign it. They're going to have no clue as to, you know, what's this about? Like this soldier in Mongolia, right? He's not going to know. Or, or uh, this man in a temple on the left in uh, the royal kingdom of uh, 
Bhutan or this woman on the right. I, I just like to talk about Photoshop just for a bit. You know, I use Photoshop to create you know, pictures like this. You know, it might take me you know, a day to do this, or this took me about a weekend to do. And sometimes I have fun. You know, here's a picture of me scuba diving off the, uh, in the Maldives off the coast of Italy. And I'll put you know, some sharks in there. But what I really like to do is I like to get the picture back to the way it looked, because all raw files need sharpening sharpening and they need some other enhancements so i like to get them back the way it looked or the way i see it in my mind's eye so here it was an overcast day photographed this yeah. tiger on the right on the right you can see what i did is i increased the saturation and the contrast here's another shot i'm in the fort worth zoo photographing this beautiful animal and turned it into this shot doesn't even look like the same picture but i don't i don't do you know a lot of you know nutty things like this I, I just try to get pictures back to the way they look or the way I want them to look like. If you look at this picture, this would have been an outtake. This is a, this is a Galapagos hawk. This would have been an outtake, but in Photoshop, by cropping and adding some color and some blur and making the water look nicer, I was able to turn you know, an outtake you know, into a keeper. So that's what I like to do, and I do the same thing in, in Aperture. And oh, oh! I just clicked the wrong thing. Oh, look at this. The, the home page for my book on Amazon.com just came up. I, I can't get out of it. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great book, and I would encourage everyone to at least go to a bookstore, pick it up, and look at it, because once you do, you'll want to take it home with you. So. Well, you know, this person, from, people... uh, from Duke, this person from Duke University wrote a really nice thing. I think it's this one, Delivering the Vision. So the rev I, I don't usually read the reviews, but this one was so nice from a Duke University fine arts professor. I thought it was uh, I thought it was really nice. But it, it is uh, one of my favorite books. And um, uh, if I could leave the folks with just one tip about people photography, it is that the camera looks both ways in picturing the subject. We really are picturing. Let me, let me get down to this picture because it goes with my little saying here. In picturing the subject, we really are picturing a part of ourselves. I think that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rick, and thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Okay, if you work hard, who's the most famous landscape photographer of all time? Ansel um, Adams, right? I don't... Well, he, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, he worked... He, he worked very hard and to get his name out there, and today, even after he's gone, his work is still displayed. I was in Mono Lake <clears throat> in a restaurant. There are Ansel Adams pick prints up on the wall. This is in Mono Lake. I come back to Cronin Huts in New York, go to the Dunkin' Donuts here, and look at his prints up on the wall. So never give up. This is very important. If you want to become a well-known photographer, never give up. You get have all these books, you know, and uh, have a ton of fun. And you might get your pictures hanging in pretty prestigious <laughs> places, too. Oh, that's well, take great. care, everyone, and thank you so much, Kathy. You, you did a great job. Thank you, Rick. You did, too. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.